RTNC Original African Stories. Listener discretion is advised as this podcast may contain violence or strong language. Previously on Ashoibi. Good afternoon, everybody. Some of you may have witnessed the scene that my friend and I caused. I apologize. I had no intention of tainting this beautiful ceremony. You see my best friend over there by the door. She just told me. My best friend just told me that she's pregnant with my husband's child. As her words reverberated a tad louder than expected, the heads under her voice turned as one to have a good look at the culprits standing at the hall's entrance. You think say now only you get Chris, Abby? You will now stand here and allow me to finish what I started, okay? Then you can go running around like a headless chicken and bring every Lagosian into every dirty detail of your life. Since that is what interests you these days. Eh, eh, Jayola, leave me alone. Leave me. What do you want from me? Am I not miserable enough? Do you not see what I'm turning into? Stop acting like everything is normal. Stop it. I'm begging you. Give me a divorce and let me go my way. This is never ending, is it? This new you. Go and shower. I'll file for a divorce on Monday. Once upon a time, there were relationships so solid that one failed to see the day when they would be no more. We are currently not very happy. Why? Well, it has been months. Months! And this trouble in paradise seems like a permanent one with no solution in sight. Well, there is also the fact that our women, Anita and Moini, although clad and in different attires this somber noon, are wearing similar cloaks of mourning and despair on the outside and on the inside. Some things should never change. Some people should be constant. I've always thought this way, but not anymore. I never thought a day will come when I'll find myself so distant from Anita. Literally, I should be right there beside her, holding her hand and helping her get through the celebration of her mother's life. But just look at me, trying so hard to avoid looking in her direction. I feel like I don't even want her to know that I came. I don't know when it was that I lost myself to irrational irritation and anger. Funnier though, I'm not sure when it was that all that fire burning inside of me was doused. I keep telling myself that it's happened after I received Bami's call about my mama's passing. But a part of me keeps pointing out the lie in that thought. It tells me that it was that defeated yet scathing look that I saw on Jay's face the night he agreed to let go of me, of us. Ha! <sighs> the smallest ones do the greatest things, isn't it? I just took my little hands and tore up every good thing in my life. I didn't even need anybody's help. Or did I do a fine, fine job on my own? Now, standing here alone, feeling like a party crasher amongst people I once called home, Common sense has returned to me. And I know now that I should never have faulted Anita's friendship to me. I look at her smiling and hugging, accepting condolences so graciously. And all I can think of is how much my old friend has changed. She was probably forced to drop her drama as mine had made public appearances so often in the past months. Or maybe that's what losing one's mother as one prepares for motherhood does. I really did feel her, didn't I? She is pregnant, alone, and friendless. <sighs> well, maybe not friendless. No, 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 no. It was always Anita and Mo. So without Mo, I think I'm right to say that Anita is friendless. Or maybe I'm the friendless one now. I don't know. I've been so concerned with my scattered life and my own hurt that I failed to notice a baby bump. And Jay, oh, I still love that man. My marriage is definitely over now though. 
All my bags are packed, and after signing the final legal document later today, I'll be on my way to sort myself out. Funny how I crave this freedom for so long, and now that it's here, I don't want it anymore. Ah, oh, well, there doesn't seem to be anybody I can throw the blame on this time except myself. Anita is standing alone now, and my feet are itching to walk towards her and to just hold her hand. I should probably go and offer my condolences. It's the civil thing to do. What I remember clearly now is my mother asking me if I would let her die without carrying my child. Of course, then I laughed and told her a lie. I told her she was definitely going to carry a child from me. I knew it was a lie when I said it to her because at that time, I was starting to accept that perhaps I was not made to get married and have children. Well, at least I know now that I was meant to have children or child. God has not clarified the part about getting married yet. This child is probably a punishment for pulling his son into temptation. Did I make a mistake by keeping this pregnancy? No. If there were words that have stuck with me my whole life, they are the ones my mother said the day I started my period. She said, and if you are stupid enough to get pregnant, be wise enough to keep that baby. That was probably the seed that formed my averseness to abortion. Mo, I wonder if she came today. I know that Babi must have informed her and Jay. How did our friendship even end? I am not sure that seeing her will help the betrayal and hurt that I have been nursing for months now. She was the only other person that never judged me. And the moment she began to turn into She-Hulk, I was ready to stand beside her and not judge her. I wonder how things have turned out in the Badibo mansion. No, I don't owe her any apology. There are two people I owe that though. Jay, who I really should never speak to again if I am to allow him to tread the path that he has chosen. And Ladi, who frankly must be sick of my constant apologies. Oh, how perfect would life have been with the idea of him he had shown to me. I could not have him around me anymore. I, I just could not. Self-supporters like me do not deserve people like him. If I had told him the reason I left was because I was carrying another man's child, he would have looked at me with disappointment and would have told me he would take care of the child like it was his. That is what I feared the most about him. He made a lot of intense promises, promises that I was too scared to believe. And Bami, I have pushed that man away so much that it now seems like the harder I push, the closer he gets. One would even think that at birth he was sent to protect me from myself in some way. Even his age-long loyalty towards me now scares me. There is nothing I have done, nothing to deserve his friendship. Imagine, he was the first person I ran to after the pregnancy test, and he has been there every minute of every day that I fear I might be starting to see him in another light. Speaking of Bami, where has he gone to hide now? Ah, I see Mo made it. I really hope she's not walking towards me to speak with me. Oh. It will do us a lot of good if she just walks past me and ignores that she has seen me. Anita watched as Moini's steps came to a halt beside her. She turned her face to the guests that were having hushed conversations her eyes scanning the room for an excuse to leave where she was now standing. Hi, Anita. Moini said softly, after a minute of awkward silence. Anita glanced at her and nodded in reply. She was uncomfortable, and she began to feel an itch at the back of her throat, causing her to want to lash out at the woman standing beside her. She wanted to yell at her and express her disappointment and shock. She wanted to hit her over and over again and not care about the consequences, but she was weak and tired of heated arguments and sharp-tongued comebacks. It was the one change she had noticed since she discovered she was pregnant. I'm sorry about your mom. Moini said again after a short pause. Anita nodded without looking at her. 
It's all right if you don't want to talk. I, I can understand that. That That's all I came to say. Anita replied dismissively. Thanks. Moini's mouth was heavy, and they held a lot of words that she wanted to release, but she was ashamed of herself, and she hardly knew where to begin. As the most logical alternative, she turned away and began to make her way towards the gates of the Momo's family house. Mo. Moini stopped and turned back hurriedly, as if she was expecting to hear her name. Without giving Anita the opportunity to speak, she threw her arms around her, the tears in her eyes flowing freely, dampening Anita's shoulders. It was the first time Moini had broken down in tears in the past months, and her body shivered and her head pounded in response to each tear that fell. I'm sorry. She managed to utter repeatedly and frantically too, like a child that was about to be beaten. I'm so sorry, Anita. I can't believe I did this. I'm sorry. Anita's mouth opened as she tried to steady her feet to the ground. And in that moment, it became clear to her that those were the words from that voice that she had needed to hear to rid herself of the excess emotional baggage that burdened her for so long. Anita, teary-eyed, hugged her lost friend in return and closed her eyes as she inhaled deeply as if the air around her had not been so fresh and light in a long time. Anita pulled away from Moini, aware of the attention they were starting to attract, looked at her friend and asked, Did Jay come with you? Moini shook her head vigorously, and Anita could tell that her friend had been dealing with just as much as her. She mopped her eyes and took Moini's hand. Let's go inside and catch up. Moini nodded and replied. I miss you. I miss you so much. I want to listen to you. I'm, I'm tired of my own voice. And if you don't feel up to it, I, I understand. I just want to sit beside you and continue apologizing. I'm so sorry. The two women chuckled lightly. <laughs> and if you stood close enough, You'd hear the relief leave their mouths as they smiled at each other. Oh, friends. Don't get it twisted. Friendship is a beautiful thing, oh. But we are still sad. That evening, an unusual type of quietness filled the Gbadebo mansion. It was different from the hostile type that its walls had grown accustomed to. It was mixed with reluctance and regret. And for this, we are very unhappy. Moini watched as Jeddah carefully rolled out the last suitcases across the sitting room and through the door to the waiting taxi. <sighs> ah, madame, you get box. Uh, madame, you should say no, I get one of that yeah, pine bag for up. Jeddah said after putting the suitcase in the boot as he rubbed his head, refusing to make eye contact with her. I'm sure that's everything, Jeddah. Thank you. Madame, you sure? I talk him because he'd be like, say, he gets one pine red bag where I never see. I just know I make you forget anything on top say with the rash. Sorry, ma. She obliged him. Okay, Jada, let me just check. She needed to say goodbye to Jayola anyway. <sighs> A heavy sigh let itself out of her. She walked back into the house and stood between the mute television and Jayola, whose head was buried in the newspaper in his hand, and took in every detail of the room. Her throat was dry, and she felt harsh, warm tears make their way to the surface but she struggled to keep them down. Now was not the time. Her eyes stopped at one of their wedding pictures and she continued to stare at it. It was her favorite of the bonds they had taken. It was an aesthetically imperfect picture. Her head was thrown back, her eyes closed, and her mouth opened wide in laughter at a joke Jayola had made and his head was tilted, his eyes smiling at her in admiration at how fascinated and optimistic she was about life. In the five years she had lived in that house, she had never seen that picture like she did on this day. It captured everything that she loved about him, about them, but it was too late. She had ruined everything. Sometimes, walking away is the best form of redemption. She stood there for a long time, the word goodbye stuck in her throat, choking her into inaction. The horn from the cab parked outside brought her mind back to the room where she stood and she sighed almost inaudibly. Jayola looked up at her from his newspaper and asked, Have you checked that you've taken everything? He got to his feet and she nodded, 
working to make the tired smile on her face convincing enough for even her to believe. Well, if you remember something, you can always come back to get it. He hugged her for a brief moment and she whispered, Goodbye. Before she made her way out of the house, resisting the urge to look back at him. She was about to enter the back seat of the cab when she realized that her phone was still inside the house. She rushed back inside and stopped when she saw Jayola still standing, his back to her, staring at the same wedding picture on the wall. He turned to her and then back to the picture. I never understood why you liked this picture so much. <laughs> what was I even saying that was so funny? See how you just opened your mouth? And see that gum just at the side of your tongue? <laughs> there are so many things I didn't think I was capable of before I met you. This whole loving another person. I never thought that love was necessary in marriage. I mean, it's a union between two people that have decided to spend their lives together because they can tolerate each other. So yes, I did not believe in love. And then you happened to me. Moini realized she had been holding her breath since she stepped back into the house. Her palms sweaty with nervousness, she managed to say. I just came to get my phone. Jayela turned back completely towards her. Mo, don't go. Her heart leaped once and she spoke faintly. What? His gaze locked with hers. Don't go, Mo. Jay, it's ruined. We can't. I, I can't, I, I can't. Yes, Mo. We have issues to work through, we do, but I'm willing. Mo, I know you. You don't want to leave any more than I want you to stay. We'll make it work. Kids, jobs, anything. We'll find a way. I... I need you to stay. She continued to stare at him, her lips quivering as she drew closer to him and took her hand in his. <sighs> Jay, I'm so scared. Watching you walk out the door just now has made it to the top five scariest moments of my life. Stay, Mo. Stay and let's talk. He kissed her forehead before walking out of the house to pay off the cab driver as he called for Jeddah and Sunday to take her baggage out of the trunk. Moini did not realize that she was crying until the tears began to splatter from the poodle on the ground into tiny droplets on her feet. Morning came and brought with it the promise of a new day. The promise of new beginnings and even more smiles. For Anita, it brought a chance to finally go home after a long night at the hospital. Excuse me, doctor. The knock on her door interrupted the short sleep that Anita had fallen into. She jerked up and looked at the nurse. Mr. Badmos is here to see you. Anita looked at the time on the table clock. What time is it? It's five minutes to five, doctor. Anita rubbed at her sleepy eyes mm. and yawned. Oh yeah, let him come in. She could not think of any reason Bami would have for coming to look for her at the hospital so early in the day. Was he in trouble? She looked up to find an obviously jittery Bami about to take the seat opposite her. Uh-uh, Bami, are you okay? I've come to pick you up. He smiled, reassuring himself that he had nothing to be nervous about. Pick me okay. At 5 a.m., shouldn't you be getting ready for work? Wait, Seth. So what time did you leave home that you're already here? Besides, my car is here. I'm just worried about you. You refuse to take time off work to mourn. You still take these night nice shifts. You just need your rest. You of all people should know now. He shifted in his seat. She narrowed her eyes at him. Bami, are you in some kind of trouble? You're acting really dodgy. He nodded and then shook his head. He reached into his pockets and held the little box between his fingers. I've thought and thought about the best way to do this and the best things to say, but I couldn't sleep all night. I, I, I want to marry you. He stared at her stunned expression. Her eyes were widened and her forehead creased. <laughs> Bami, am I still sleeping? <laughs> Anita, I'm serious. And no, this is not because I pity you or any logical reason your head is coming up with right now. No. I love you immensely. I don't understand it myself, and I just want to take care of you and this child. I want it to be my duty. I want to marry you. Her mouth opened and in disbelief, she nodded her head slowly 
She really did not deserve the things that Bami was saying to her. She did not deserve him. Yes? Bami asked excitedly. She chuckled with tears in her eyes. <laughs> did you ask me anything? He smiled and walked to her side of the table, his right knee holding him to the ground. He opened the box and looked past the tears in her eyes and she felt like he could see into her soul. Like he could tell what she was thinking. She saw the nervousness he walked in with float away and the confidence that she had not noticed in him before covered him. It was almost as though he already knew what she was going to say. Now, she could not remember why she had put herself through all the pain and disappointment when he was right there, where he was now, beside her. Anita, Ejeme, Momo, will you marry me? She shook her head continuously as the tears broke freely and fell uncontrollably down her face. Yes! Yes, 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 thank you, yes. Yes. You do know what this means, right? You're not sleep talking, are you? He asked before pulling her up. Her lips flattered and she came closer to him. Thank you. No, thank you. He whispered before he took her lips with his and she shut her eyes, savoring every moment of what she deemed their first kiss. <laughs> yes, finally. Mm -hmm. Anita threw her eyes open with a smile on her face to find the same nurse she thought she had seen earlier standing beside her. Doctor, I'm so sorry to disturb you, but it's already past five. Anita glanced around her office subtly, and that was when she realized she had been dreaming again. She sighed and nodded at the nurse as she began to pack up her desk. At that moment, her phone vibrated, and without looking at the caller ID, she picked it up. Are you home already? It was Bami. Her heart jumped. No, not yet. Just leaving the hospital. She could hear the nervousness in his voice, but she decided not to question him. Is it... is it okay if we do lunch today or dinner? Lunch is fine. Yeah, lunch is better. Um, all right, I'll see you later. She smiled to herself, her heart fluttering as she picked up her bag, wondering just how often dreams actually come true. Oh my god! Oh my god! Why won't you pick up your phone? I want to scream! Sorry, B. I was sleeping. I woke up and looked at that rock again. So it wasn't a dream? Bami took his eyes to the market, oh. Ah, ah, that rock is something. Aww. Sure you're in the rest of today. I'm coming to see it for myself. Aww, sweetie. Congratulations! <sighs> Classic going to Sokoto to look for what has been in my Shokoto. I've missed this bee talking to you like this. Me too, babe. I'm so sorry. You, how many times do you apologize now? It have do. Don't make me start crying again. LOL. So preparations have to start ASAP now, Abby. Oh my God, you're getting married. Wow. 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 I've been chanting I'm engaged in my head, though. Totally forgot that that means I'm getting married. I'm crying, Mo. I don't deserve this. I don't. Babe, don't say that. You do, okay? Ahem. You know the one that's number one on my agenda now? Of course. We have to choose Ashrebi. Yes, ke. Double Ashrebi, in fact. One for the naming ceremony, one for the wedding. Don't worry, I shall begin my search and research ASAP. It's not easy to be an auntie. LOL. Trust you. I love you more. I love you more, Anita. Moini had kept trying to decide if it was time to tell Jayola about her and Zeno, but she couldn't convince herself on either cause of action. There seemed to be no right answer. It could ruin the fragile foundation they were rebuilding. And if she didn't, there would always be this secret she would have to bear, just as she had borne the secret of the IUD before. She stepped out of the shower, wrapped herself in a towel, made a firm decision in her head. Zeno was in the past. There was no point digging up old skeletons, dwelling on the past. She would focus on the future. Jair mm, mm, stared at his phone mm, screen mm, and allowed it to mm, ring out for the upteenth time. Mm, he had successfully mm, avoided her for long weeks mm, now, mm, and he was sure she was smart enough to receive his subtle message. Now it was clear to him that either his perception of her was faulty or he had by that one regretful act 
latched on the devil to his back. Baby, I'll be down in a bit, okay? Moi's voice that now sounded melodious to him reached his ears, and he was grateful again that they were on a new path to work out the old kings in their marriage. They were going to get it right this time, starting with their dates tonight. His phone rang again, just as he decided to pick up the call and hopefully put an end to the looming nightmare threatening to jump out of the phone and finally destroy the marriage they were about to rebuild. He heard Moini hurry down the stairs. She looked new. Even the familiar glint in her eyes made him feel like he was seeing her for the first time. Oh yeah, let's go and stop looking at me like you want to take me back to the bedroom. Mm. Mm. She smiled and made her way to the door. <laughs> oh babes, you have no idea. He glanced at his phone and then at her back. Let me just quickly send a message. I'll be with you now, now. He took a deep breath. I thought you were smarter than this. Please don't call me. Do you really need me to tell you that whatever it is that happened between us was a big mistake? I'm not leaving my wife and I don't want anything to do with you anymore. I didn't want it to come to this. But if you try anything funny, you know that I can destroy you and Jimmy for a long time. So please, please, leave me and my wife alone. Jay. He hit the send button and picked up his keys from the sofa before making his way out of the house. There was so much he wanted to say to her, but for now, the past would have to wait. He joined her at the door, kissed the faint dimple on her left cheek and said, I love you, baby. And for the first time in a long time, it didn't sound like just an age-long ritual. And here ends our story. Thank you all so much for listening and sharing Ashray B with us. Oh, and thank you for all the comments as well. We really appreciate them. And we hope you enjoyed reading it as much as we enjoyed writing it. The end. Cue Ashray B theme song. Thanks for listening to Ashray B, the podcast. Brought to you by The Naked Convos. Produced by 808 Extra. Narrated by Fei Fei. Theme song, Charles Onwubia, a.k.a. Beethoven. Voice actors, Eniola Keshiro as Moini. Onafori Kwale as Nurse. Iloise Omoimi as Jeda. Jasper Tomomewo as Jayola. Shea Banks as Bami. Jojo Aimiegbe as Dr. Anita. This podcast is available everywhere you listen to podcasts on. Don't forget to subscribe and share.